All right. So when we when we took break on Tuesday, we started to just kind of scratch the surface of these Hayworth structures. And the idea behind the Hayworth structure is that this is a representation of for five and six um, membered carbohydrates, which are the more common carbohydrates that we encounter. This is how they usually end up going. They usually end up by basically reacting with itself. And in the reaction with itself, we go from having that linear brick, that linear structure that we've seen all the other ones do, which the Fisher projections take care of, to this ring structure, which is called a Hayward structure. Now, when it comes to drawing these structures, it, it's going to take some practice, which is why those questions are in the homework for this evening. But the overall process to do it isn't too bad once you kind of get used to it. And so one thing I will do, um, there are a couple of videos out there by another Dr. Bruck, not me. Um, but in those videos, she goes through how to do this kind of thing and kind of goes through it step by step again. And there are some, uh, there's a resource that she uses for extra practice and I'll share that resource with you as well. But the first thing that we would do is if we have a Fisher projection, remember in the Fisher projection, we've got the carbonyl group at or near the top, depending upon if it's an aldol or uh, a keto form. But we're gonna take that oxidized carbon and we're gonna shift it. We're gonna turn it 90 degrees so instead of having that aldehyde group on the top, the aldehyde group is gonna to move to the right. And then all we do at, in this first iteration is we just move everything accordingly. So all of the groups that were on the left-hand side are now on the top. All the groups that were on the right-hand side were now on the bottom. And the sixth carbon, in this case, the CH2OH, just happens to stick itself on the end there. So that's the first part for us to do when we're trying to kind of figure out how to project this. The second thing that happens is that we actually need to make the ring. And where the ring comes in is it's this last chiral carbon is going to connect to the head here to make the ring structure. Now, what that ends up looking like is if I draw this out, this oxygen is now going to be part of the ring. So it are carbons one, two, three, four, and five. So I'm going to have a six-membered ring. The six-membered ring, it's going to be a hexagon. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to insert oxygen into the hexagon shape there. That's going to be the basis of the ring itself. And now it just becomes a matter of numbering. So oxygen is number six. The rest of the carbons just continue to follow suit. And what's unique about this fifth carbon, this fifth carbon has the sixth carbon in the chain sticking off of it as well. So I still have a six carbon chain but now I've got one of those carbons hanging out off of the top. 
and replacing it in the ring is the oxygen from that fifth carbon. So if I look at step two here, step two says take the oxygen from the last car chiral carbon, attach it to carbon number one to make the six membered ring. We just did that. The next step would be to draw the new hydroxyl group on carbon one. Why do we need a new hydroxyl group? Well, if I've got this carbon, this carbon has added, it's got the bond to this carbon. It's got the bond to this carbon. <clears throat> and it's got the bond to this hydrogen. This carbon already has four bonds. To add another bond to oxygen would give it five. It can't have that. So what's going to happen? This double bond is going to turn into a single bond. And this oxygen is going to have to grab a hydrogen so that it has its proper number of bonds now too. Where did that hydrogen come from? Well, it came from here. When that OH, when that oxygen on that OH went to make the ring, that oxygen had to create a second bond, which means that the bond for that hydrogen went away. So what we're seeing is just a rearrangement of the atoms in this compound. So I now have an OH on the end of this carbon chain here. So I've got an OH group and I've got an H group on this first carbon. The designation, we now have two designations. In these ring structures, we can refer to alpha or we can refer to beta. And alpha or beta just depends upon where that OH group is on that first part. If it is in the downward position, we call that structure alpha. And it would be alpha D glucose. If that OH is in the up position, we would call that beta. It would be beta D glucose. So the last step in the making of a uh, Hayworth structure is figuring out where everybody goes. So let's make alpha here just for the sake of argument. All of these chiral carbons stay chiral. They all have two bonds going off them. So we can just continue to draw a line up and a line down off of each of them. The fifth carbon here, well, the CH2OH is gonna be in the up position, which means the H is gonna be in the down position. Everywhere else, we just follow the Fisher projection. So on carbon number two, OH is in the down position. So we put it in the down position, it, which means that H is in the up. Carbon three, OH is up, H is down. Carbon four, OH is down, H is up. And so, this new structure would be alpha D glucose. Go ahead. Yes. 
Right. Right. So whenever we're determining alpha or beta, we look at the first carbon and we look, where is that OH? Is it up or is it down? Up is beta, down is alpha. And then the rest, it just comes down to what was the chain beforehand. So really, none of the chains have changed. None of the carbons have changed other than the first one. The first one has changed, and the fifth one has changed a little bit because of what oxygen did. The first one has changed because we took that carbonyl and turned it into an alcohol. So completely different, completely different everything. You know, alpha particles, beta particles, all that nuclear stuff. That applies specifically to nuclear processes. These aren't going to exhibit nuclear kinds of tendencies. They're not radioactive. Well, so we got to look at the hot at the fifth carbon here. So the fifth carbon has the oxygen that made the ring. It has the CH2OH that is always pointed up. And then it has the hydrogen here. And since the CH2OH is up, that means that the hydrogen has to be down. Okay. Okay. So like I said, this carbon didn't really change in terms of what was um, attached to it other than the oxygen migrated. that migrated over to create the ring. So would it, would it be a good way to just think of like, since that OH was the carbon, would it be a good way to just see the base of the CH with the change in the carbon? Like, would that be a good way to like, I mean, yeah, you can think of it, you can think of it that way. In your book, it kind of shows that. It shows that CH2OH kind of making a, like a right hand turn to um, you know go into that upper position. But we have to understand it was always connected to the fifth carbon. Yeah. We just are no longer thinking of it as uh, we yeah, we're thinking of it more as a side group now instead of as part of the chain. Now it's still a six carbon carbohydrate, but anytime we have these ring structures at least one of those carbons is going to be sticking up off of the ring. And if you look at something like fructose, which is a ketone, you'll actually see that there are two carbons that are sticking up off of the ring because it only makes a five-membered ring. So it's got six carbons, five-membered ring. One of them is oxygen. The other four are carbons, which means you've got two carbon groups sticking up off of the ring, one on either side. All right. All right, let's, let's draw just for completion here. Let's draw beta D glucose. We already drew alpha. Let's draw beta. And so if we do that first rotation, we have So two carbons, three, four, five, six. And we've got a 
So there's our Fisher projection turned 90 degrees. So um, at this point, um, I'm going to answer that by saying you will need to know what D glucose is, you know, from a Fisher projection. The beta wouldn't come in until we turned it into a Hayworth structure. And so if, I, if, if we were asking you to draw this, I'm anticipating at this point, I don't know for certain. I'm anticipating at this point that I would ask you to be able to create the Fisher projection and then convert it to a Hayworth structure. And so it would probably be a two-sided question. Part one, do this. Part two, do that. Okay, so once again, just for numbering's sake, start at the aldehyde. One, two, three four, five, six. Just like we saw before, the oxygen on the last chiral carbon attacks the carbonyl. We're going to end up with a six-sided ring with oxygen in the ring. So There's our six-sided ring with oxygen. I'm gonna add the other sticks. So those sticks represent the five chiral carbons and the things that are attached to them. Carbon number one, since this is beta, that means that the OH is gonna be in the up position and the hydrogen in the down. Everything else, we can follow the um, Fisher projection here. So OH down here, H, OH. And then on top, H, OH, H. For carbon number five, carbon number five, we've got this CH2OH group and this hydrogen, the carbon group always goes on top, and the hydrogen always goes on the bottom. And so this was D glucose, the hydroxyl position in the up turns this into beta D glucose. So when you come across those questions in the homework for tonight, this is what you're going to be asked to do. Rotate it. Recreate it. And figure out where that OH group is going. Does it go up or does it go down? Is it beta or is it alpha? All right, questions with glucose. This, like yeah. here. So the alpha and beta structures, um, let the alpha and beta structures can interconvert. So it's not a matter of, oh, the carbonyl group was on the, the higher side or the lower side. It has more to do with this structure can open and close. And what we see is that for whatever reason, that beta isomer with it in the upper position is roughly two thirds of all of the D glucose that exists. 
The other third is um, the alpha form. They do interconvert between each other because that oxygen ring does break and it really does come down to, keep in mind these are single bonds, single bonds can rotate. And so when that ring opens, that bond rotates, it makes it so that that bond, that uh, OH can go down or it can come up. So yes, it is kind of a positional thing, but it's it's not quite as simple as, okay. yeah. And so that's why we largely stayed away from that conversation part of it. But we do see both of these structures do exist. There isn't one clear cut answer and one not so much. You know, 36% is still a pretty good chunk of the glucose. Yes, and that's why we have that no, no, that notation to standardize, okay, when we say alpha, this is what it means. When we say beta, this is what it means. Just like with D and L, the D and L notation was all about that last chiral carbon as well. Is it on the left or is it on the right? All right, when it comes to fructose or any other keto, uh, the projection is a little bit different. And the reason why it's a little bit different has a lot to do with, again, since we've got that carbonyl group in the middle as opposed to on the end, the ring that forms is going to be a little bit different looking. Now, the approach we take is exactly the same. Last chiral carbon swings around, grabs the first, um, the most oxidized, uh, the, the, the carbonyl. And everything else kind of falls into the same pattern as well. Alpha and beta still indicate the position of that OH group. Now on this carbonyl carbon, carbon number two, as opposed to carbon number one. So now carbon number one and carbon number six are off of the ring. The ring starts with carbon number two and it's carbons two, three, four, and five in this case. Um, for, for the fructose. But if we write it and draw it, again, turn this 90 degrees, carbons three, four, and five should be along the bottom, H, OH and H, and they still are. It's the last carbon in the ring points it up. The only reason that this CH2OH on carbon number two isn't pointed up is because this is the beta form. And the beta form says the hydroxyl group is, is pointing upward. So we let, the, we let the OH group dictate where the CH2OH is on the second carbon. On the fifth carbon, it's always up. All right. All right, let's look at uh, beta galactose. And so our first task would be to recreate the Fisher projection, turn it 90 degrees. So I've got CH2OH. 
There are one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in total. So two, three, four, five, six. Starting at this one and going along the bottom, it would be OH, H, H, OH. And then H, OH, OH, H. We go through the same process. Oxygen attacks. We're going to make a six membered ring because this is an aldose and not a ketose. So, oxygen, two, three, four, five, six, and close it off. So, this is carbon one, two, three, four, five. Six. So now it's just a matter about filling it out properly. This is beta cyclic. So beta means OH in the up position. And now I just follow the rest of the story. OH on the bottom, H, H, OHs and H on the top. H, O, H, O, H. There's my beta D galactose. All right, so this, I'm, this is going to take a little bit of doing just to kind of get used to this. It's a process. I'll be real honest with you. It's been quite some time since I took biochemistry. I had to reteach some of this stuff to myself as well. You just have to sit and you just have to kind of draw it, go through the process uh, a couple of times. You know, even if you're practicing the same ones, still just kind of getting used to kind of making that muscle memory of, okay, this is what I do first. This is what I do second. This is how the ring looks. And it, once you get into that, it does get easier. Now, like I said, I'll, um, the other Dr. Breck I'm referencing is my wife. Uh, she uh, has taught for a while at uh, Wabash Valley College. She teaches biochem. Um, uh, she taught an, an organic and biochem course there uh, when she was teaching there. Um, and so she's got some videos that I'm going to share with you. Um, that will kind of help. She also has a kind of an extra practice activity that I'll share with you as well. And she's got a video where she walks through the, the practice activity. So I'll, I'll give all that stuff to you. Uh, probably won't show up until tomorrow or the next day, uh, just because priorities are probably, this is not gonna be your, your first priority um, until after the exam. Um, but I will give you the material that you need um, to give some more practice on this because it does take that. All right. So that closes up, you know, basically what we were supposed to finish on Tuesday. Uh, let's get into some newer stuff. So we're moving off of some of the more kind of nuts and bolts kinds of, of thoughts of monosaccharides. We're gonna get into some application stuff and then we're gonna talk about some of the reactions that these monosaccharides undergo. So what are some properties that we can associate with monosaccharides? Well, some of these sugar alcohols
are the result of some other kinds of reduction processes. Uh, these are known as reducing sugars. And because they are not sugars in the sense of like what our body processes at sugar, they can be added as artificial sweeteners. So when you look at things that are marketed as uh, sugar-free or containing some sugar alternatives, that's, these are some of the most common ones that exist. So here's something like sorbitol. Sorbitol has a structure very, very, very similar to glucose. And so what you can do with these sugars, so notice all that's different about them. What are we missing? This isn't a true carbohydrate. It's missing the carb meal. So there's no ketone, there's no aldehyde. Like I said, this is a reduction process. So one of the things that we talked about at the end of chapter 12 is the reduction of ketones and aldehydes to create alcohols. Well, if we have a ketone or an aldehyde that is part of a carbohydrate, we reduce that. You get a reducing sugar, a sugar alcohol. Has a lot of the same sweetening kind of effects, but because it isn't truly a carbohydrate, your body doesn't process it that way. How does that come about? Well, we have to understand that when it comes to reactions of these monosaccharides, Monosaccharides can go in either direction. If I have a monosaccharide, and in particular, if I have an aldose, then something like Benedict's test can be used to oxidize that aldehyde into an acid. And the result of that oxidation process is that the copper in Benedict solution turns brick red. We talked about that a little bit in the last chapter. Now, how that all works is the only way we can really get to this is if we have the open chain form of the carbohydrate. Remember, if it goes into that ring structure, the aldehyde group isn't there anymore. The aldehyde group got turned into an OH group. But because that inner conversion always is taking place, there's always a small amount of the aldehyde or the ketone present. And so in the case of this, if I have an aldehyde group with a hydroxyl group next door, like we do in sugars, we can reduce it, or excuse me, we can oxidize the sugar and turn it into an acid. And so, you know, last chapter, we kind of, you know, glossed over Benedict's test. Benedict's test isn't really a great predictor of aldehydes. Benedict's test is a really good predictor of carbohydrates because I have to have both of those things present. I have to have an aldehyde group and an OH group next door. If I don't have both of them, the Benedict's test isn't nearly as effective. But if I do, like I do in carbohydrates, then it works really, really well. So when sugars are oxidized, the resulting product is something called a sugar acid. And the sugar acid's name gets changed from whatever it was, O's. So glucose, you know, glucose, fructose, galactose, you name it. We change that O's to onic acid. 
So instead of glucose, it turns into gluconic acid. Instead of lactose, it would be lactonic acid. Instead of fructose, it'd be fructonic acid. That is what the product of the oxidation is. So glucose is still glucose if it hasn't been oxidized. Once it's been oxidized and converted into an acid, that's how we change the name of that substance to reflect its acid character instead of its um, other character. We can also see this going the other way around. So carbohydrates that participate in this oxidation process are known as reducing sugars. And so like you saw in this scenario here, this glucose was able to oxidize or excuse me, this uh, glucose was able to reduce the copper two to copper one. So it got oxidized, the copper got reduced. That's when we can refer to it as a reducing sugar. So when something gets oxidized, that sugar that caused the oxidation is called a reducing sugar. Now we can also see the reverse happen. So oxidation processes, we had that aldehyde group turned into an acid. Well, like we saw with the sugar-free examples there, we can also go the other direction. If this aldehyde group gets reduced and turns into an alcohol, then the resulting sugar alcohol, sometimes known as an aldehyl, in glucose, we can either call it glucitol, or the more common name is sorbitol. So for those reducing sugars, for the resulting sugar alcohols that are made, they have an ending change as well. Their ending gets changed to its hall. So that's why for glucose, glucotol is one name. Like I said, sorbitol seems to be the more common uh, version. But we can also see that if we have, for example, D xylose, well, D xylitol would be the name of the sugar alcohol that formed after its reduction. D mannose could be converted into the sugar alcohol D mannitol. And so, again, if you look closely at a lot of the sugar free kinds of products that are out there, especially for sugar free gums. Um, we tend to see a lot of these in those, especially. We see it in other places too, but you know, if we're looking at like diet sodas, there are usually other sweetening agents that are used instead instead of sugar alcohols. Okay, so. What happens when we reduce D mannose? Well, for the reduction process, we would be talking about the use of hydrogen and a catalyst. And remember, reduction is going to attack heavily oxidized carbons. And so really all that we would see
is basically an addition reaction across that carbonyl. So very similar to the addition reactions that we saw, the hydrogenation reactions that we saw in alkenes and alkynes, mm -hmm. that hydrogen basically would just hang out over the carbonyl and one bond would be made to the carbon, one bond would be made to the oxygen, and the carbonyl would basically turn into a single bond. Since we are dealing with a creation of a sugar alcohol now, this would be D mannitol that was created. Because again, all that we do to change the name of the sugar to the sugar alcohol is change the ending to itol. All right. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. So this is this is one of the ones I added, I think. Questions? Okay, so where does any of this begin to matter? Well, one of the places it can matter is um, in glucose testing. So glucose testing is important, especially for, for those who are diabetic. Um, diabetes being an excess of glucose in your blood and stemming from your body's inability to convert that sugar into, um, into uh, other products. Now in clinical testing, we can use um, an oxidizing reaction to turn that glucose into the oxidized gluconic acid. And using a test strip, the dyes on the test strip will change different colors based upon how much of that conversion actually took place. So the larger quantity that ended up being converted, the more intense the dye color gets. You can match the testing strip against a, a kind of a color wheel and get an idea of, you know, just how bad the blood sugar is in this patient. And so if we're going on a diagnostic kind of journey, we're trying to test whether or not someone has uh, uh, diabetes in the first place, a urinalysis is probably the most preferred method of doing it. And the primary reason is um, the excess glucose will find its way into the urine because your kidneys are unable to function to fully process it. And so you can do a urinalysis, test the urine for the presence of glucose and using Benedict's test, um, we can get a pretty good idea of what the person's blood sugar is based upon how much the blue color in that Benedict's reagent changes. So they do, they do um because all of those body systems are all interconnected in a lot of ways um
All right, let's let's move into uh, section six here. In section six, we're going to start going away from just looking at monosaccharides, and we're going to start looking at disaccharides. Now, disaccharides are found through the chemical bonding of monosaccharide to monosaccharide. And that chemical bond can exist between two of the same monosaccharide or two different monosaccharides. Now, regardless of how the construction goes, the process is essentially the same. What we're gonna see is a dehydration reaction of sorts where a bond is gonna be created between the two using the OH of one of the sugars and the H of another one of the sugars. And so if I take that H and that OH off of the molecules, H plus OH is H2O, water, that's how we can call this a dehydration reaction or a condensation reaction. And the net result of that water being left behind is that a bond forms between the two rings. So that's how we get a disaccharide. Now, how we come up with, there are some nuances in the naming of these disaccharides in terms of where they link to each other. And so you're gonna see terms in here like alpha and beta coming in again. And it's gonna be referring to which part of that ring is doing the attaching. So is it an OH in the beta position? Up. Is it an OH in the alpha position? Down. And then the numbering here are gonna be the linkages between the two sugars. So which carbon off of the first sugar is attaching to which carbon on the second sugar? So we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that um, in a second here. So lactose, lactose is a dye sugar. It's a disaccharide. It is formed by the bringing together of galactose with glucose. And we can see we've got galactose here on the left. We've got glucose here on the right. The linkage that is being made is between this OH group And this H group, this OH group is in the one position. This H is in the four position. So the linkage, the bond, they call this bond beta one four. Why is it beta one four? Because we are talking about the OH group in the one position, in the beta position on the left sugar and the OH group on the fourth carbon in the other. So again, remember we number one, two, three, four. We always number basically from the offside of, of the oxygen. So that's how we describe the linkage. In terms of is the isomer alpha or beta, we do the same thing. We look at that last carbon next to the O and look at the OH. Is it down, alpha? Is it up, beta? So that OH being in the down position means that it's an alpha. We call this alpha lactose. If this OH was in the opposite position, we would call it beta lactose. Now you'll notice that pretty much comes only from this sugar. 
this sugar here was alpha here, it's still alpha after the process. <clears throat> so here are some common combinations. If I get glucose and glucose together, the result of that marriage is maltose. As we saw in the previous slide, if I get glucose and galactose together, the result of that marriage is lactose. If I get glucose and fructose together, this is the one that we're most interested in, that one is sucrose. The reason we're most interested in it is because that's the sugar we are the most common and familiar with. Sucrose is table sugar. So when we think about you know, cane sugar, sugar coming from you know, natural products, that's this one. So table sugar is a natural disaccharide. All right, let's take a look at each one a little bit more closely. Maltose. Maltose is known as malt sugar. We see maltose come together through the linkage of 2D glucose molecules. Now, you know, which one we see, so right now this is showing two alpha D glucoses coming together. And if that is the case, then we would get this alpha 1,4 bond. Alpha, because the OH group in the first is in the down position. 1,4, because the linkage is occurring between the first carbon on the left and the fourth carbon in the right structure. And the result of alpha maltose coming from the fact that this isomer here is still the alpha isomer. Now, where do we see maltose? Well, we can get maltose from the hydrolysis of starches. So if I have a little bit more complex of a sugar structure like a starch is, um, when we dehydrate that, when we get it to start to break down, what we will see is that these maltose molecules um, will start to break off. And where we tend to find these, these come up a lot because they are starchy in grains. So where we see it, we see it in cereals, we see it in brewing, we see it in candies to some degree um, when we look at um, different kinds of uh, uh, malted candies that come out there. But certainly cereals and brewing make a lot of sense given the origins of those and you know, what we can use grains for other than you know, flour and cookies. Milk sugar, lactose. Lactose comes from the uh, combination of galactose and glucose. Similar kind of idea. Here we've got beta galactose and um, alpha, glu uh, alpha glucose. And like I said, in kind of that introductory slide, we're gonna get this alpha one four linkage because we've got the alpha one position in the galactose reacting with the four position in the glucose. Um, sorry, not alpha, uh, beta. It's in the up position. So we've got this beta one four linkage taking place here. The net result of alpha lactose comes from the fact that that glucose is an alpha glucose and not a beta. Where we see lactose the most is in milk products. Lactose makes up about um, 6.8%, 6 to 8% of human milk, 
somewhere around four to five percent of cow milk. But again, it's formed from that combination of galactose and glucose. I don't. Um, you know, if uh, I won't even I won't even elicit a guess here. It would be too much of a conjecture. Go. Not all milk sources, not all mammary glands are are built the same. They're, they they are built to the specific needs of the animals that are going to use them. So that would probably be my best kind of general answer is probably just that as humans we, we process it better as as children um uh and so you know but to some degree that would make sense uh babies have a harder time processing really sweet things uh, especially very early on they like sweet things but um yeah given too much sucrose um it can really have some pretty bad effects on their health Sucrose, table sugar. We get this from sugar beets. We get this from sugar cane. When we say sugar, this is usually what we're thinking of. Sucrose comes from an alpha and a beta E. Alpha glucose, beta D fructose. Now what's interesting about this Kind of unique in that perspective. Because fructose does not have an aldehyde as its base, but rather a ketone, the resulting structure that we get isn't a linear horizontal choo choo train, but rather this vertical kind of bonding situation. The other thing that's really interesting, right here, we cannot open it up. There is no alpha or beta form of sucrose because the bond that it makes is a one two bond. There is no OH group on that carbon to make it the alpha or beta because we use that OH to make the bond in the first place. So there's only the one isomer. And it's not a reducing sugar because its chain doesn't open up. It doesn't convert from one to the other. primary reason it can't is because to open it up, I'd have to break this bond. And so that bond is a lot stronger than the kind of equilibrium that exists to open and close the chain. So sucrose won't react with Benedict's reagent because it doesn't have the necessary tools. It doesn't have the requirements. There's no aldehyde group here to open up to create. While we're on the subject of sweeteners, we know that all of these disaccharides involve some kind of sugar. But we also know that sucrose and its counterparts. So we talked about fructose on Tuesday, high fructose corn syrup being the derivative of that. <laughs> well, so when, when you get into the uh, artificial sweeteners category, the the primary advantage to artificial sweeteners 
from a standpoint is we don't have to use nearly as much. So, you know, whereas we might use grams of sugar in a product, because aspartame is, you know, 18,000 times, uh, well, okay, uh, let's do 180 times sweeter than sucrose, we don't need to use nearly as much of it. So in an application where we use 40 grams of sugar, we could use whatever 40 divided by 118, 180 is. So to make it as sweet as. Okay. So instead of using grams of sugar, we could use milligrams of aspartame and get the same sweet effect. Now, anyone that knows diet drinks knows that yes, they do have a sweet flavor. They also usually have some kind of an aftertaste to them and you have to decide if you're okay with living with the aftertaste or if you'd rather just drink the sugar. I know which camp I am. I will drink the sugar. But this is a really kind of, this is a cool table to look at because you can see, you know, with fructose, you know, fructose is about 75% sweeter in terms of its taste than sucrose is. Because on this scale, sucrose is 100, fructose is 175. So that means it's 75% sweeter tasting. So you take that and you concentrate it like they do in high fructose corn syrup. And now you're dealing with a really powerful agent that you don't need to add a whole lot of to get a desired sweetness level. And so that's the aim. Now, again, as we, most of us will probably attest, there's usually a difference in taste in terms of something sweet with um, high fructose corn syrup versus something that is um, treated with uh, real sugar. I mean, even just like sweet tea and aspartame mm -hmm. would be <laughs> All right, so we, we are out of time for today. Now, all that is left out of this chapter is to talk a little bit about some of these artificial sweeteners and to talk about polysaccharides, which are basically just extensions of what we talked about uh, with the disaccharides. So what I'm gonna do is rather than do all of this on Tuesday, I'm gonna just do what I did last time we kind of fell a little bit short. I'll publish a video that covers the, this last portion and I'll post it to YouTube tomorrow and you can view it at your own leisure. It'll help you with the homework assignment that's due on Monday night, but we won't, we won't spend any more class time on it because there really isn't anything there that would require more than you just kind of reading up on it and if we have questions about it, we can talk about it on Tuesday. All right, study session tomorrow. Hope to see most of you there. Have a good weekend.